Hello and welcome everyone to 2021 Linux Foundation Open Source Summit happening in Seattle. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on from where you are watching. And, and thanks for um, joining us to learn how to build an AI marketplace on top of Kubernetes. Uh, myself is Animesh. Uh, I'm the CTO for Watson Data and AI Open Source uh, Platform Efforts. And with me, I have my colleague, Christian Kagner. Christian, why don't you go and introduce yourself? Hello, um, my name is Christian Kadner. I work with Animesh. We both work for the Center for um, Open Source and AI. And Animesh and I have been working on several projects together. And this latest project, the Machine Learning Exchange, is what we're going to present today. Great, thanks. Yeah. So uh, let's get into the business. As Christian mentioned, right, we work for a group in IBM Core Code. So we'll probably, you know, get started with that. So the topic of our session today, Machine Learning Exchange. And uh, if you're hearing this name for the first time, uh, today is when we are actually, you know, bringing it up for the first time in a public uh, domain in a conference, right? So let's just go right through it. So uh, we talked about CODE, right, which stands for Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. Um, you know, it's a group uh, in IBM focused, as the name uh, suggests, very much on open source data and AI technologies, including some very popular open source projects like Spark, TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, you know, Qflow, and, and, you know, we work in these ecosystems and, and we're responsible for, you know, ensuring that what we need uh, as, as part of, you know, making these projects work in Watson, also, you know, what we need in terms of enhancing these projects as part of the community request which come in. Now, the beautiful picture you see there is of IBM Silicon Valley Lab. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of Silicon Valley though it's much away from the hustle and bustle of Silicon Valley nestled in between green mountains. We do have our own cricket field as well as you can see. So, and, and a lot of good hiking trails nearby. It's just in the middle of nature. So if you want to live in Silicon Valley and work in Silicon Valley and not be bothered about by all the hustle, bustle and traffic, this is a place to be, right? Cool. So I think uh, let's get started with the topic. Um, and if you are familiar and, and, you know, as we are looking in the machine learning and AI world, uh, essentially at a very fundamental level, what we are doing is, you know, we are using data to build models, which are then automating decisions, right? And this is throughout the AI life cycle, right? We use data, then build models, which help automate decisions. Now, this is a high level view of the, the AI life cycle, but if you look from the pillars of AI life cycle, data sets and models, totally stand out, right? And when you zoom into this, you see that, hey, these steps are probably not as simple as it appears at the very first outset. You know, each of these uh, different um, uh, horizontal streams would be data preparation, for example, which includes data cleansing, data ingestion, going all the way to transformation, feature engineering, doing data splitting, right? That in itself is a huge field in itself, right? There are multiple products, there are multiple companies just specializing in that particular space. And then uh, moves and comes the machine learning and AI space, which is all around, you know, how to create that initial model, then, you know, launch distributed training, uh, how to do hyperparameter optimization, how to do neural architecture search, then validating your model, that whole middle piece where you are essentially, you know, just in the machine learning and AI model creation phase and running distributed training, finding the right hyperparameters, that in itself, again, you know, this is, is a field where a lot of the products and, and a lot of companies specialize in that area. And last but not the least is essentially the area where, you know, uh, you have models deployed in production, but models unlike applications are living and breathing entities, right? You deploy an application, uh, you send it the same input six months later, as long as you haven't changed the application version, you're guaranteed to get the same output. Not so much in the case of models. Right, you have the same application, uh, same input, uh, but six months down the line, even if you haven't changed the model, right, it is going to give you vastly different output because models are living and breathing entities, right? And he hence, you know, this process is very iterative. You need to be doing it again and again. You need to be rolling out Kennedy versions. Uh, sometimes your data set is changing. Sometimes there is anomalies. So you need these automation pipelines, right? So as we talk about the three pillars, right? So we saw and definitely understood that data set and models are the pillars, but pipelines have become very, very important when we are looking at, you know, automating the whole data and machine learning uh, life cycle. 
So that's where, you know, uh, we sincerely believe that, you know, machine learning pipelines, data pipelines, they are the third pillar of this whole structure. So data sets, models, and pipelines. Now, how do we speed up this AI life cycle? Right now, with the number of steps, as we just discussed, needed to be performed in data and AI life cycle currently, right? The process itself remains bifurcated amongst various teams, right? We have parts of the team, which as you saw, are doing you know data part of the life cycle, parts of the team, which are creating models, parts of the team, which are doing feature engineering, creating set of new features. And, and because of these bifurcation and, and long uh, horizontal uh, uh, life cycle processes, what is happening is, you know, there is a lot of duplication and redundancy. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you have similar set of features being created. A lot of times you have similar versions of the data sets being created. The models being created are, are very similar pipelines, more so the specific pipeline tasks. There is no reuse, there is no sharing, and everyone is working in their silo. Right, so it's becoming very clear that, uh, you know, there is, there is a stronger need for a central data model and pipelines catalog, right? Which we can share and reuse across organizational boundaries and not only organizational boundaries, also across different parts of the data and AI life cycle, right? So the uh, teams who are doing and creating features in the data life cycle are, are actually be able to share some of those things when they are in the machine learning part of the life cycle. Similarly, you know, all these different models and data sets, engineer data sets, they are being shared. So now that we need a central data models and pipelines catalog, right? And the other part is you also want a strong governance and traceability and lineage, right? And why is that important, right? When you go on the internet and if you search, you will find all, all kinds of data sets. You'll probably find you know thousands of models if you Google for it. What is missing is a audit check, a quality check, having a proper licensing mechanism. Can you take this data set and can you use it right off the box without worrying about licenses? Have all the sources been identified? Is there proper lineage tracked as part of the data set metadata? Right? You want that all part of, of you know, this central catalog, which can tell you that, hey, if you are picking up something from here, make sure uh, you are ensured that you know it has the proper license, it has the proper traceability and lineage. You can find you know, how the data set has traveled or the model has traveled. So that is also, you know, very central piece of this uh, catalog which we talk about. So with that, we are announcing the machine learning exchange, right? So as you saw, as I mentioned, right, if you're hearing this name for the first time, yes, that's correct, because this is the first time we are actually announcing it. We are joining hands with Linux Foundation, AI, and data. We are announcing and moving this project in open source. And not only we are moving this project in open source, we are actually moving in open governance. That means, you know, the license, the trademark, everything is in a central place and being owned by Linux Foundation AI and data. And we will be working with the larger community and the partners there in Linux Foundation AI and data to jointly evolve this together, right? Because we firmly believe that to create this ecosystem of data sets, models, pipelines, you know, we need to do it in a, totally neutral way where the foundation has the ownership rights, there is a neutral license, and we work as a community member in terms of advancing this. So Machine Learning Exchange is the project. Jointly, we are announcing with Linux Foundation AI and data, and this is how it looks like, right? So I talked about pipelines, data sets, models, definitely, as we are aware in the data science stream, um, notebooks is the language, right? How you actually write data science, I mean, uh, I think we don't need to debate it anymore. Almost everyone is using uh, notebooks to create a lot of the initial models, write their data science code, right? So that's also you know, uh, available as part of the machine learning exchange and you can go and look at all these different architect, uh, artifacts. Let's go through them one by one. So, and before we dive a bit around the architecture, right? So, and some of the capabilities. So what does machine learning exchange actually provide, all right? So there is a read-only version, which is the hosted version. You can actually hit a website, go there, and that's a read-only version where you can look at the assets and browse them, All right? But there is also uh, a version which you can actually, you know, pull from GitHub, deploy it at your own end, right? Which allows you to upload, register, execute as well, right? So you can upload your own assets and register them, and then you can launch them, right? Uh, including AI pipelines, models, data sets, and notebooks, right? 
uh, it generates when you register, for example, a model, it generates automated sample pipeline and behind the scenes, right, for example, to deploy your model on top of a Kubernetes cluster or care serving, which is an embedded engine, right? So pipeline engine here in this case is powered by Qflow pipelines, which is a very popular open source project for machine learning and data pipelines. And we are using Qflow pipelines on Tekton uh, uh, under the covers to actually power this. Then the serving, when you are actually deploying your models, that's powered by another very popular open source project called Care Serving, right? And we'll talk a bit about uh, Care Serving and, and pipelines in the detail later, right? And then there are other projects which, which form the basics uh, of it, right? But at the very high level, there is a UX, there is an API server, and then, you know, backing all these assets, metadata is a relational DB and the assets actually, uh, and it's the metadata is being shared be, between the object store and the relational DB. So let's talk about you know how pipelines work. Essentially, you know this is the pipelines tab. As you can see, you can go and search for pipelines. You can select a pipeline, and then you know after you have a look and this is the pipeline you want to run, then you can actually launch it, right? So in, in some cases, you don't like the pipeline you see, then you can actually go ahead and register it uh, in the executable version of it, right? If you're standing this platform at your own layer. Uh, while launching the pipeline, you can select the parameters and input your own values. And then the pipeline is launched behind the scenes. It's essentially using the Qflow pipelines on Tekton engine and giving you uh, logs uh, being streamed in real time, giving you metadata, giving you visualizations, and you know creating a lineage, right? As your pipeline is running, you can have a lineage view of, of all the artifacts being produced as part of that. Essentially, pipelines are made of pipeline components, right? So we also provide a way for you to actually register your own components so that you can share and reuse across folks, right? So if there is a component to, in this case, what we have is a very simple one, like, you know, it's just echoes, but you can think of like, you know, some components, some things you are doing again and again, like you're creating a Kubernetes secret or you're downloading a data set, right? Some of the tasks which are done again and again, which need to be plugged in into multiple pipelines, this is the best place to come in, plug them and test it out, right? Without having the need to create a pipeline. You know, you can just register your component, launch it, test it out, that it works. And then, you know, you can use it as part of the different pipelines. Models. I think as we talked about, right? Models is, is a very, very important, the end piece of the puzzle, right? When you go through this big data and AI lifecycle and then you're producing these models. So there are a lot of pre-registered models which come as part of machine learning exchange uh, around object detection, around text sentiment, classifier, etc. So you can pick and select from them or you can register your own models, right? Now, once you launch the model, you can look at the model description and we also generate, uh, because the model metadata YAML based on that, generate some automated code so as to be able to deploy your model. You can deploy your model on Kubernetes cluster or you know the embedded cave serving engine which comes as part of the uh, machine learning exchange, right? So <clears throat> you can select a model and then just launch it, right? Give it a name and launch it and deploy it. And it will essentially, you know, deploy it on the underlying embedded machine learning exchange model server platform, right? Which is powered. Now to deploy it again, it will use the Qflow pipelines engine, right? Which is essentially taking your model bits, downloading it, and then pushing it on the, either the Kubernetes directly or the embedded KF serving engine, which comes uh, with machine learning exchange. Now, data sets is one of the most important pillars of this life cycle, right? As we talked about, so you can essentially go browse the data sets, look at the details, look at the metadata. In this case, we are looking at JFK weather data set, which is essentially, you know, focused around all the different climate characteristics, temperatures, coordinates, humidity, et cetera, around JFK airport. You can select this data set, you can launch it. Now, what does launching mean in the context of a data set? Essentially, the default functionality out of the box is it's going to download this data set onto your Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster, wherever you are running machine learning exchange. It's gonna download it and create a PVC persistent volume claim, which can then be used by the rest of the parts of the life cycle, right? So for example, if you need to launch distributed training later on, right, the data set is now uh, downloaded and made available on, on part of your, on your Kubernetes and OpenShift cluster. It creates a PVC for that, for a persistent volume. And as we go through this, like Christian is going and uh, to come and, and show some of these assets as well. 
And similarly, uh, notebooks, right? So we essentially, uh, you have the similar mechanism. You can launch a notebook. It will execute it as a batch process. Behind the scenes, we use a project called Elira and Elira's notebook component to actually take your notebook, treat it as a single batch process and launch it using the Kubeflow pipelines uh, uh, under the covers, right? So uh, that's how notebooks work. And you can also see it later, you know, as we go through some of these demos. Okay, and now, uh, you know, this is the part which is showing you, you know, how you can launch a notebook and by launching a notebook, as you saw in our, in our data set, I talked about, you know, the uh, data set, which was downloaded on a PVC here. You can launch that notebook, which pulls that data set from the PVC and then runs analysis on top of it. Right? So this is the notebook, which is, you know, pulling uh, the data set, the JFK data set from the persistent volume claim and running analysis on top of it. And you can see the log stream streamed in real time. Okay, uh, let's talk about a bit about the catalog, um, the actual content, right? So, so far we showed you the, the framework. How does it work? What are the capabilities? And this one, you know, goes a bit into the catalog and the content behind it. So, as I mentioned, right, there are some default samples which come pre-populated, uh, you know, models like uh, around uh, object detection, image caption generator, image resolu resolution enhancer, weather forecaster, or, you know, uh, data sets like CodeNet, Finance Proposition Bank data sets, JFK data set. Uh, then there are pipelines and pipeline components, right, which we have created, which are around, for example, trusted AI umbrella, which allow you to detect uh, fairness uh, on your models or do adversarial robustness check on your models, right? And then also, you know, there are pre integrated uh, sample notebooks, which come as part of it. Now, obviously, you're not limited to these. When you're running your own instance, you can come and register your own assets and use it with machine learning exchange. That's the main, uh, you know, uh, calling point here that th though it comes with some pre-populated assets, the goal here is to for you to bring your own assets and register as part of it. Now, let's talk about data sets, right? So as we talked, right, it is one of the most important pillars of, of uh, out of the three we talked, like data sets, models, and pipelines, right? Now, if we see, the actual machine learning revolution is fueled by data, right? If you look at something like ImageNet, right? In 2009, there were 3 million images with approximately 5,000 classes. Just three years later, in 2012, that number has increased to humongous 14 million images with 22,000 classes, right? And that essentially fueled what we call, you know, uh, a revolution around image classification, image detection and all these models coming out, right? Where you see, you know, it, it actually started surpassing human level capability on some of these narrow tasks. So if you see the graph here, for example, you know, at some point in, in 2015, right? We, we started uh, actually surprise, uh, surpassing human level intelligence in, in terms of image net classification errors. So the point here is like, you know, the revolution and fueling that data set with large quantity actually helped to get to that level of accuracy and the sophisticated models being produced, right? Now, even if you look at the progress in general on AI, even when we talk from the IBM's perspective, like 2011, we had the Jeopardy, right? Where essentially it was more um, structured data in terms of, you know, the question and answering or in case of Jeopardy, like answers and questions. But by 2019, we had Project Debater, which was actually able to work on unstructured data, be able to debate, form logical, rational arguments with the debaters, professional debaters, right? So, so, so to get that kind of advancement, we need, you know, that huge corpus of data. So, as as I said, right, we have seen the power of this this AI, which was being applied to human language, right? If even if you look at it from the perspective of the speech performance, right? And you look at the first DNN back into 2012, and now when you look at at somewhere in uh, between 2016 and 17, it actually surpassed human capabilities. All the voice and conversation back and forth, which, for example, we provide in a product called Watson Assistant or document understanding, all these things, you know, started sur surpassing human level capabilities with the explosion of data, right? And that started creating a huge market for them. Now, similarly, code is the language of machine, right? AI will help us also to master, master code, right? So what we need essentially is, you know, um, uh, AI and machine learning models, right, which can bring the same revolution, what happened on ImageNet, what happened with speech, 
back uh, to code, right? So essentially, AI for code needs its own ImageNet for breakthroughs, right? We need code language translation. We need to find if codes are duplicate. We need to find, you know, if they're similar. We need to find areas where code can be improved, whether it's performance improvement, memory improvement, or you know, the holy grail where we just want to give description and want machines to generate code. Now, how do you get to all these, you know, sophisticated models? You need that huge corpus of data set. So with that, you know, IBM back in May announced Project CodeNet, which is a very high quality code data set for algorithmic uh, innovation, right? It has around 14 million code samples with around half a billion lines of code across, you know, 4,000 code problems and 55 programming languages. So if you see, there are, you know, uh, this is this huge innovation and breakthrough which was done as part of this. And that actually gives you a lot of these capabilities, which now you can create a lot of these sophisticated models where, you know, uh, on these diverse classes of problems. So Coordinate is actually the largest, you know, open source data set available for AI for code, right? And, you know, it works across polyglot languages, multiple languages, as you can see, as mentioned here. And by virtue of that, as I was talking about, you know, the content which we have in machine learning exchange is very high quality. Coordinate is an example. Coordinate is available through machine learning exchange. You can essentially download it and use it. And, you know, later on, we are going to see a quick demo essentially involving Coordinate as well. You know, you can see the description. You can uh, look at the metadata and go through some of the lineage and traceability and make sure the license is correct. All that information is available to you in this single place along with associated notebooks and models, right? So there are associated notebooks and models which we are providing around coordinate and we will be expanding this ecosystem. And this was essentially to, to highlight the fact that, you know, the content which we are actually putting in machine learning exchange is of high quality, right? And we are going to be working hard at it to make sure that it ends of that. Some of the integrated technologies, and I wouldn't spend too much time on these. Uh, this is data stream, which essentially is used behind the scenes to actually download the data set and create a PVC. It's a project uh, built on the Kubernetes custom resource architecture and part of LFAI. Chef serving, this is the engine on which your models are deployed when you actually choose to deploy a model. You can deploy your models on Kubernetes natively directly, uh, but if you need more for sophisticated deployment technology, this is this comes pre-built and pre-integrated with machine learning exchange. Pipelines, right, which is at the heart, like everything we are doing for any asset in machine learning exchange is being executed through pipelines. And that engine is powered by Qflow pipelines on Tekton. I will spare uh, some of the architectural details here, right? But as you can see, this is a Kubernetes um, you know, pipelines engine built using the Kubernetes custom resource architecture. And if you're aware of the Qflow pipeline ecosystem, it's very popular with data scientists as well because it provides a Python DSL to program uh, using Python. Um, and this is what we use heavily uh, within uh, machine learning exchange to power uh, all the actions which are happening with any single asset, right? Whenever we are deploying a model or we are downloading a data set to create a PVC or we are launching a, a notebook, everything is you know, being triggered under the covers using this pipeline engine. And since we are on the topic of pipelines, we have an uh, enterprise product called Watson Studio Pipelines, which essentially is built on that engine where you can essentially get a lot of the pre-built notebooks which can run much sophisticated uh, Watson capabilities like Watson Auto AI, uh, data refinery flows to handle your ETL needs. You can actually run uh, web service and online deployments, batch deployments, and it also gives you a very solid drag and drop uh, interface to drag and drop different components and create your model um, different pipelines. So definitely check it out if you're interested in, in pipelines and the pipelines ecosystem. Okay. Uh, with that, I will pass it on to Christian to take you through some of the capabilities of machine learning exchange. Over to you, Christian. Thank you, Animesh. That was great. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen, Animesh? Yeah, again. Fantastic. Um, so what we see here, that is the user interface of the machine learning exchange, um, like you've seen in the animated GIFs that, that Anima showed in his presentation. And you can see on the left-hand side, it's our navigation, where you can navigate 
through our individual um, asset types. As you have been told, we have um, data sets, we have models, pipelines, components, and notebooks. For the demo part, I will start with the models um, because the models you know, are really at the heart of anything in machine learning. And um, we have the benefit of a, a sister project here at the IBM Center for Open Source Data and AI. Um, and that project is called the Model Asset Exchange. And we were lucky enough to feature those, those models here in MLX. And um, I will show one of them. These models, um, they have been containerized. So they have been pre-trained and they can be searched um, and inferenced for. Um, when you click on a model in MLX, you'll see the, you know, a description um, that you know, tells the user what this model is about, um, what the framework was that it was trained on, and what the license is, and you can navigate to, um, to the website where there's more information, in this case, the model asset exchange website. Um, each of our assets um, are, are based on um, YAML metadata. So when you um, upload a new asset, type, um, that metadata will tell us what to present in the catalog and also what can be done with the particular asset. Um, so for this model, you can see this model can be served um, and it can be served either on Kubernetes natively or with KS server. And it will always uh, also show what the images that the Max team has built for this model. Um, if you're interested, we also um, generate some uh, Kubeflow pipeline code that's the code that will be used to launch the pipeline that in this case will serve, serve that model. So let me go to the launch dialog. Um, it will ask me uh, a few questions. Um, in this case, I want to serve this model um, on Kubernetes. I can give it a run name, but um, I can also stick with the default, click submit. And now you will see um, the Kubeflow pipelines, um, graph of the user interface where you can see the execution graph of that pipeline. Um, this particular pipeline um, starts with a configuration part where the model configuration will be generated. And once that part is done, the model will be served. Um, if we are short on patience, we can go to a previous model run that I did just before this demo um, to save some time. Um, the pipeline will take about a minute or two to complete. Um, and once it's complete, you will see that model has been deployed. And in the input output parameters, um, you can see that this model has been served on, on a local IP or an IP address from the cluster, which is accessible. And you can go to that model and the model will have um, a Swagger generated UI um, that allows to get some metadata on the model and also to inference, use it for inferencing on pictures. So this particular model is an image caption generator so let's try it out um, on an actual image. So on image, um, I took the liberty of getting your profile picture and I'm gonna see what this model will do. Uh, we can execute this model. Where it will tell you it's a Hollywood movie star. Hollywood movie star, um, <laughs> almost. It says it's a man in a suit and tie and smiling. Okay, at least it, it finds me smiling. Uh, so that's, that's good. <laughs> All right, so this was one example of um, what you can do with, um, with models that have been pre-trained and containerized. Um, as the second part of our demo, um, we will show um, one of our, our pipelines. And one of the very, very important aspect of machine learning, of course, is, is that um, you know, not only that your models are accurate, but also that they are fair. Um, so we have this trusted AI pipeline and that makes use of um, two other related projects that we've been helping out on. Um, IBM Research has put out two projects called um, the Adversarial Robustness Toolbox and um, AI Fairness 360. And both of these capabilities are part of this pipeline. Um, on the right side here, you can see the pipeline that was compiled into a text on YAML format. Um, that is more for machine re readability not for human readability in this case. But um, we also have the details for this pipeline and we are able to launch this. And in this case, we have um, preset most of the parameters and you can run with the default parameters. And once you click submit, um, the, the three steps of the pipeline will be executed and it will start with training. So this was my previous run. Um, it shows the model has been trained um, over um, 
a, I think a sample data set of 20,000 faces um, of all kinds of um, ethnicities, um, both all kinds of genders and um, age groups. And after that model has been trained, um, this pipeline performed a fairness check and a adversarial robustness evaluation. And it will also show the metrics um, that got generated with this with, in this um, evaluation step. Now here you can see that here you can see that um, the model accuracy on that test data is about 86 percent, pretty good. On the samples that we were feeding to that model, it's not so great because we only did I think five epochs of training iterations. So that particular model would be would not be very robust um, against um, adversarial yeah. attacks. Yeah, I think this is the the metrics there are like highlighting very clearly that you know the the if you're generating adversarial inputs and and sending it there, the model accuracy drops heavily, right? So it's it's definitely vulnerable to adversarial attacks. Yep. And that would necessitate that the you know, model gets you know retrained and made more robust. Um, and I think the adversarial robustness toolbox um, has tools for that as well. Now on the fairness side, um, we see a similar output, similar metrics. And um, this is a gender classification um, model. And um, the classification accuracy here is about 86%. And one interesting metric here is the disparate impact, um, which is 91, uh, 0.91. Um, and if it's, you know, I think between 0 0.8 and 1.2, that means it's it's not biased particularly either way, which means that this is, a, you know, a fair gender classification model. And there's no bias towards race or age in this case, if I understand this right. Yes, and and if you use this toolkit, like you know, there are in addition to this, there are over seventy plus metrics on which you can you know evaluate the fairness of your models and find out whether they are biased or not. And if it does found to be biased, both with adversarial robustness toolbox as well as fairness check, if you if they are found to be vulnerable to adversarial attacks or if they are found to be biased. Both these toolkits actually provide mitigation algorithms, right? So you can now implement. So there are 10 plus algorithms, for example, in AI fairness to, to mitigate bias. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Sure. Um, and um, I think as last part of our demo, um, we can showcase um, our project CodeNet, um, project CodeNet data sets, and notebooks that we associated with this. Um, so from the project CodeNet, which is which is extremely large, as Aninosh mentioned, we have two subsets. Um, one subset um, for a mass language model and one for a language classifier. Now that language classifier um, basically you know, classifies a, a, a code snippet. Um, and the output is whether or not that code snippet is written in Python, Java, uh, C, C sharp. Um, you will see here some, some more description on the CodeNet data set, similar to what Anunash had shown in his presentation earlier, and links to all of those data sets. Um, it will show the license, the size of the data set. And as with uh, all of our assets, um, we have a YAML file. A YAML file describes the asset so that MLX you know, knows what to do with it, what to display. Um, and when we launch a data set, um, we will use data shim under the covers, and we will um, download that data set and mount it to a persistent volume. Um, and that can be used later in other asset types. For example, the notebook that I'll show in just a moment. So when I click Submit, there should be a two-step pipeline. Uh, one, one of the pipeline steps takes our metadata that we use in MLX and converts it to the metadata we need for data shim. And then once that um, data set metadata has been generated, um, data shim will be used to mount it. So earlier I ran this. Um, and after the metadata was generated, the persistent volume was created, and you can see that PVC has an identifier. Um, I can either copy that and use that, or I can go to the related asset of that data set. Um, the notebook that we have for this one is also called um, a language classification notebook. Um, the UI looks very, very similar to all of our, as of our asset types. And um, this notebook um, can be previewed here with our um, with the Jupyter Notebook Viewer that we integrated. And um, this is a read-only view, but um, you can see um, all of the code cells in that notebook. Um, you know, you see some output, um, and at the end, 
the notebook should um, uh, you know, take, take a bunch of code snippets and then um, run through the classification with the um, with that particular model. Um, I can launch this model. Um, we plug in that um, data set PVC that we created earlier, um, mount it to a local folder, and click submit. This will um, start our pipeline. And that once that um, once that pipeline run is kicked off, um, there will be a pod created on the Kubernetes cluster um, for that. And once that associated image has been pulled and the run has been kicked off, there should be logs streaming in here. Um, that will take a while. And because that does take a while, um, I have the output of that notebook that I generated just before this demo. Um, that notebook gets regenerated. Um, there, the pipeline will generate an HTML output. So once the notebook has been run, all of the cells and the output of the cells um, can be seen in that notebook. And then at the very end of the notebook, um, typically you can see some of the metrics. Um, you can see the training and delegation accuracy um, and a little test. For this test, there were um, 100 uh, code samples with 10 samples for each of these languages here in C, C Sharp, C++. Um, and so on. And you can see uh, that test here was fairly successful. Um, all of these, for each of the language, all 10 um, samples were um, classified correctly. Um, the notebook that went into this training, um, however, only had uh, actually a lower classification. So that's interesting. Um, so if you go into that notebook, very bottom, um, and before we run this, uh, you could see that the code samples that were chosen for Previously, um, only had nine um, correct C samples and nine correctly identified C sharp samples, uh, C plus plus samples. Um, this was my demo, Animesh. Um, I hand the screen back to you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for walking us through the capabilities of machine learning exchange session. So, uh, hope uh, you know you all uh, enjoy it. Uh, uh, learning about machine learning exchange and the capabilities it has to offer. Uh, definitely, you know, reach out to us if you have more questions. If you want to try it out, later is a read uh, only version which is hosted at ml-exchange.org. And if you want to, you know, give it a try on GitHub, GitHub.com slash machine learning exchange. Right, that's that's the GitHub organization where you can actually go. Uh, but if you have to remember one link, ml-exchange.org, just hit it out and, and it will take you everywhere else. Uh, you. That... I believe you have a slide for that, Animesh. You can sh share your last slide. And then we'll okay, go. let's bring it up. Cool, here it is, right? So these are the links you need to remember, like, you know, where to go, um, um, website for machine learning exchange. Remember, it's a read-only version, so a lot of the capabilities you were seeing as part of Christian's demonstration, they're not available in that read-only version. You can definitely download the assets, browse the assets, go through the description, but if you need to do more, go to this GitHub, right, and actually get your own version running, right? So yes, you can look at the uh, read-only version here on mlexchange.org and go through the different assets, but better still, like go to this machine learning exchange Get this project, get it going on your laptop. You can actually use Docker, uh, you know, to get it running on your laptop. Or if you have a Kubernetes cluster, that's best because you know that gives you the full blown capabilities and also allows you to register and use your own assets, right? So strongly encourage that. Um, there is one more thing which I do want to highlight right before we go away. There are some, you know, awesome talks happening. Uh, from IBM Code A team, right, throughout the Open Source Summit North America, right, uh, talks which go deeper into, for example, the Kubeflow pipelines on Tekton project, or, you know, how to build a feature store using Feast and KF serving, right? How do you actually defend against adversarial model attacks using Kubeflow and adversarial robustness toolbox, which we just talked about, right? And so please, uh, you know, go ahead and join our other talks and give things a try and, and provide us any feedback. And we'll be glad to see you on as a contributor, as a user of Machine Learning Exchange. Thank you.